Paul for uh, joining you, us at Bull Cup of Coffee, and and obviously uh, for anybody watching this, that you were here this weekend yeah. at uh, in Edmonton, Alberta, a fellow yeah. Canadian. Yeah. And uh, so you spoke at Gateway Alliance Church, and some of the things um, I think we're going to touch on this morning, you went a little bit deeper into on that weekend. Yeah. And so we're going to put a link um, into this video to those, the links of those videos once that they're, uh, once they're produced with, uh, with Gateway. Um, but yeah, I just want to, um, as we mentioned earlier before, <laughs> before we started videoing that uh -huh. uh, Bull Cup of Coffee is really um, an environment. One of the things that we kind of evolved into is this idea that, you know, we want to look at healthy and helpful dialogue in a right. world full of conflict and disagreement. Right. And so... I, I don't know if there's too many accidental authors, as you put it, who have had a more conflicting book, The Shack. Um, and so I, I have my own personal story with that book. But before we get into that, uh, you want to just take a little bit to kind of explain, um, you know, some uh, a little bit about the book for anybody who may have never heard of it. And also yeah. just a little bit of like some of the reactions and, you know, uh, obviously the story behind it, things like that. Sure. So, yeah. um, the Shack was never written to be published. Mm -hmm. That's the accidental author piece. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I was a writer since I was little. Uh, that was a, one of the only ways to get my inside world out. Yeah. And then it turned into something I could give as gifts. Poetry and songs and short mm -hmm. stories, you know, all the, all the stuff that everybody does. And then um, um, my wife, Kim, had been encouraging me for about four years to, you know, would you just put something in one place that is, is a gift for our kids that it that explains how you think because you think outside the box mm -hmm. and uh, by the way <laughs> later when it actually got in print she said you know i was thinking like four to six pages yeah. <laughs> so it was uh but i got it done for christmas and we made 15 copies at office depot and it did everything i ever wanted it to do um and then when my friends started giving it away it started this whole unbelievable thing the book itself is a parable i think is the best way to classify it yeah. it's um it's a mystery suspense wrapped in a what if and the and the what if part is what if in the middle of our especially our human tragedies and losses and there is no deeper the loss than between a parent and a child mm -hmm. what if there was a god who is actually good all the time mm -hmm. and involved in the details of our lives and so when I wrote the book, I'm wrapping up my own autobiographical history inside this storyline, and I'm asking really authentic human questions. And I think that's part of why it did this massive thing that it did yep. and continues to do. And that is because human beings identified with the questions, mm -hmm. plus they identified with the loss. So it gave them a language to have a conversation about God that wasn't religious. And it also validated their great sadnesses. It said, your tears actually matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a lot of us who, especially in a Western culture, we don't deal well with grief. We don't, we don't know what to do with loss. And then we have a theology that kind of intimates that God is behind our griefs and our losses. And so we don't even have God to run to. Yeah. And so in the shack... You've got a main character who has a massive loss. And the God that he had in his own background and tradition um, was insufficient. Mm. Actually, was a no-show. And uh, a lot of us have experienced that sense of, you know, I, w I wanted to trust you, but you didn't turn. You didn't show up, you know. And uh, so Mackenzie has to go back to the place of his great loss and uh, in doing so is confronted by a very different God that he had imagined. Mm -hmm. And um, and then it unfolds from there. So the shack becomes the centerpiece for um, the icon, if, if, if you will, of his great loss. Yeah. And then um, the, the character and nature of God surprises him mm -hmm. in, in God's goodness. So, yeah, so what happened was is that when people r read the book or even more heard about it, <laughs> yes, <laughs> because I think, frankly, that probably 95% of the people who are upset about the book, and it's a small portion, actually, mm -hmm. uh, of people who responded, but the ones who are upset, I'd say at least 95% have not read the book. 
you know, and uh, or if they say, well, I read it, they're talking about the cover. <laughs> yeah. So, but you know what? I get that. Um, we have this huge addiction to being right. Mm. And we have a huge aversion to being embarrassed or feeling like we were wrong about something. And it sticks us into a place that is almost impenetrable when it comes to the exchange of ideas or the, the possibility of growth. I grew up evangelical fundamentalist. The people who don't like the book and are mad about it and haven't read it, those are my people. Mm. And I completely identify with them because I, I know what that's like. I know that you're afraid to lose the grip on your rational propositional truth. Yeah. And you think like, you know, it's, it's a slippery slope, you know, so you don't want to go, go down there. And, and when I grew up, questions weren't, they weren't encouraged at all. In fact, they were considered rebellion. Mm -hmm. And over my lifetime, questions have become, a, uh, they're among the greatest of my friends. And, um, and I really believe that, that God constantly invites questions. If you look at Jesus, every time somebody asks him a question, except maybe twice, he responds by asking a mm -hmm. question. A question is an invitation, you know, but a lot of us don't know how to do that. So when we ask a question, a lot of times we are wanting the person we're asking to agree with our presuppositions. And we don't even want to listen to what they have to say. You know, because we're 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 afraid of that, and uh, so I've had I've had some great pushback, great responses, and I love the pushback. You have to understand, people that are mad about the book, I don't take that personally, mm -hmm. right? I didn't write it for them to begin with. My kids love the book, yeah, <laughs> so, and uh, um, but it means that they're engaged. An angry person is an engaged mm. person. An ambivalent person. There's really no conversation. They just don't care. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd way rather have somebody who's upset and mad about something than somebody who just doesn't care. Yeah. And, um, and when a person who's angry, when they come to talk to me, which is rare, because most of the time, especially in the age of the Internet, it's so much safer to lob bombs from an anonymity, right? You, know, you can do it without any kind of personal, face-to-face, -face, relational uh, interaction, yeah. uh, which, is, which is very sad on the one side yep, um, and it's telling you build a relationship some, but with someone and it breaks all the rules all your internal rules right yep. and um, and when that person is humanized in your when you hear their story mm -hmm. God, it's, it's so hard to keep your presuppositional fury in place you know so but when people do come and they're upset and they want to talk to me I'm at a place in my life I've gone through enough change and with enough great sadnesses and mm -hmm. the crucible of the transformational process that I know they're not coming to tell me about me because they don't know me mm -hmm. right we haven't even had that conversation yep. and so they're coming to tell me in the only language they know how about what matters to them mm. and what makes them angry what they're afraid of uh, they may think they're coming to, t to you know to change me or to fix me or whatever um, which is possible. If, if, I'm not, if I'm not at risk, I can actually listen and engage with what's being said. Because yeah. every conversation is potentially a two-way street, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so if they're upset and stuff, and I'm not at risk, I'm really free to, to ask a question back and, uh, rather than try to defend myself. If I think yeah. they're telling about, talking about me, then we're going to have a war, you know? And, um, but I'm, I think I'm mostly past that. <laughs> it's a little tough when they go after my kids. Though. Oh yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, that's a, that's a whole other thing when it's, yeah. it's a lot easier to take the criticism yourself than to see a loved one. Yeah. Taking that Cause criticism. I'm not at risk, but no. you know, don't put my kids at risk. And it's interesting. There's a few things that you said. Um, one, I, you know, it's funny because when this got set up, I just, I kind of laughed to myself because, um, I was one of those people who had opinions about the book, who had never read the book, but I also had a platform because I was a preacher and I had yeah. a church that I was ministering in. And so um, I, I, I know I was, I was chatting with a mutual friend of ours who was talking about, you know, you had, you had interacted with somebody who was a pretty prolific preacher, um, 
pretty public. Pretty public, uh-huh. who who ha- had got up and said, you know, don't read the book. And then you said, thank you for selling, you know, well, selling yeah. so many copies. And it was the same <laughs> thing. It was this funny moment for me to realize something as a communicator. Because, one, I hadn't read the book, but I, I had people, prolific people, you know, that, that had said, don't read the book. And so I was just, you know, yeah. parroting what they were saying. I was just... Yeah basically plagiarizing you know their words and got up in front of my church and said all the reasons and the funny part was is that it was never even my intention to turn the message on a soapbox about the sure. shack but it was like a message on discernment and <laughs> super funny and the then I, and then i went on this soapbox <laughs> rant about this book and then finally like seven people in our church went out and bought it you know and it was this it was this realization in my mind that it wasn't just that, that was one of the first things that i realized it wasn't just what you said but even how you said it. Yeah. So even in that moment, I hadn't like reverted over to like accepting the shack, but I realized that my, that my communication style or how I chose it actually did the opposite of what I, I was intending to I do. I got a great story. So there was an entire denominational leadership in mm-hmm. Australia that banned the book as heresy. Mm. It was so great. And so they, uh, they had their national Congress or whatever, and they, yeah. they determined that the book was heresy. So they told their pastors and they were, you go back to your congregations and you tell them mm-hmm. not to read the book. So they did. Well, um, I was doing this little uh, trip through, speaking trip in Australia. And uh, I don't know, about six months later. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about this. And uh, Baxter Kruger and, yeah. I, and I were, you know, were just speaking places. One of them was in Adelaide. Well, we find, we find out that two weeks before we get there, the this particular denomination had a change of leadership in their church, mm. and um, so they had you know afternoon tea. Come meet the new pastor and his wife, with uh, you know questions and response time, and this was about six months after this edict had gone down. Yeah. So during the Q and A Q and R, uh, somebody says, "So, have you read anything good lately?" And obviously, the new pastor's wife had not got the memo because yeah. she reaches in her purse pulls out the shack and says, this is the best book I've ever read. How many of you have read it? And three quarters of the congregation put their hand oh, up. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh, yeah. That is that attempt to control. Exactly. And they're really, like, um, in our context right now, the big thing that we always talk about is like, you know, there's this, this sense of needing to have control or top down or this idea. It's like, it, and and it's more on the side of like morality than the things, but theological or whatever. And it's just like we want to really create a place for people to be free, like you said, to question or to belong. Yeah. Or if you, if you come into our community and you're a hot mess, that's okay. Because the problem is when you have the other side of the coin, you know, there's that legalism and anarchy, and you want to be in the middle, wisdom yeah, yeah. and the Holy Spirit. But if we, if we were, we've been asked, if we were to pick one or the other, we'd rather a person come who is at least authentic and understands who's able to share because then we know at least a little bit more instead of this you know i'm, I'm putting a facade up yeah the veneer yeah of my theology my thinking my worldview my morality or whatever but there are things everybody's got something they're, de- they're dealing with yeah. you can hide it well but at least if you're honest enough to say like this is where we're at this is the questions we're and it's like okay let's that's Jesus. Let's, let's I'd walk, rather let's walk rather be around the the thieves yeah. and the prostitutes than yeah. around the you know religious people. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. and we we get characterized a lot too. It's like, well, then you're just condoning, and and, and we've had to kind of you know you have to do the shifts, and you, we've done a whole things where it's like, hey guys, don't get us wrong. Just because we're grace filled doesn't mean that you know that we're just like yeah, do whatever you want to be destructive and self you know. There's as yeah. any parent, right? Like you in like you yeah. see as a parent does with their kids. You know, it's the same thing when you're shepherding. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's funny because it's, you know, what was even more interesting for, not more interesting, but another part of that story too was that, um, yes, I found out those people who read those books, but I also had somebody that came to me and, um, and, and not even so much because I was speaking even in particular, like they were, they were trying to defend the shack or I had name dropped a few other things, but they sat down with me and just said, like, I just need you to understand if this is the type of church we're, we're going to, that we're, we're going to be about against things or slandering or blah, 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 that wow. like our church, like we're, we as a family cannot be a part of that type wow. of church. And I, I really respect it. And it, we're really good friends now, me and this individual, yeah, yeah. you know, and, uh, and, and what I really respected about, about that interaction was that he had enough character yeah. to come to me. Yeah. And what really struck me in that moment was 
he at least took me out for coffee very graciously. Yeah. Very just trying and trying to understand where I was coming from. And what was really funny was, even though, like I said, I hadn't, I hadn't flipped my position or anything like that, but I remember after that message and all that stuff going like, that was not a, that was not a right. Well, I did like, I did not shine in that moment. Yeah. And, and the message didn't get recorded. Wow. Like there was no digital record of it at all. Now I've talked, I haven't talked to the guy who's doing the sound. He was always a mentor of mine and he was, to see if he'd read the book. No, 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 he was, but he was the one doing sound. And yeah. I, I keep going, I should ask him like, was there really technical difficulties or were you just a Covering little bit you. You're going wide going, yeah, yeah. love covers we're, a multitude. Yeah, we're not, we're not going to deal, you know? So I said, I told the guy, I said, I'm honestly, I'm actually really glad it never got recorded yeah. because it was one of those moments where in the weaker moment, you know, had yeah. done it. but what really struck me was like, he had enough character to come talk to me. Well, he was free to love in a way that yeah. you weren't at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. But what also was like, how many other people just left? Yeah. It hit me into thinking, oh my goodness, like, this person, the way that I communicated, how I communicated, why I communicated, struck enough with him that he was considering going, if this is, I, I just, I cannot be attached to this. Yeah. In our Canadian passive aggressive culture, <laughs> more people would just so leave. Sorry. Right. Well, I'm, I'm well. I'm yeah. French Canadian, so at least we're. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm from a French Italian family, so at least we're much more vocal. We were at least a little more, but yeah. But it just it struck me in that too, and that started a journey as well in looking at how do we better dialogue in this thing. Well, here's here's, and you're telling on yourself, and I'm so appreciate that, mm -hmm. um, because that's that's a courageous thing to do, and it's a and it's a really great way to help people. But but even in what you said, yeah you relied on your platform more than your integrity, mm. right? Yeah. You, you didn't do the work and you let your platform speak. Yep. And that does not communicate wholeness to people. No. And, and, and yet at the same time, we're trying to deconstruct platforms so that we know everybody can hear the voice of the spirit, yep. but you know, but I'm going to hear the voice of the spirit for you. Yep. And, and I'm, I'm with you. I've said so many stupid things in my life and, <laughs> And, you know, the people that are that are uh, upset because it challenges that even the idea of the books that even if they haven't read it mm -hmm. challenges something that they hold precious. Um, those are our people. Those are our people, yeah. you know, and, well, and, uh, and, I, and I love that because there's something you said this weekend where you said, you know, don't touch them. I don't yeah. remember the exact yeah. word you said. It's, said, it's be not careful recorded. how you talk about. Yeah, it. It's, yeah, it was in our it was in our interview time the service, so that's yeah. not recorded. But I just loved it. It struck me because you've come out of that, and there was a lot of hurt in your life yeah. because of it. But you came out of that still, and I mean, there's probably the ups and downs and how you had wrestled it. But you're in a position or a place in your life where not only you're saying yes, there there's 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 issues yeah. in that camp, but that yeah. you you strongly warned and said, I, I'm ready to stand up and fight to defend these people because I love them. I, absolutely. You know, and yeah. that, that struck me listening to that interview. That was huge for me, watching Sweet. going, huh. I have a friend of mine, Ron. He, he starts many of his conversations, and he, you know, he's a man's man. He played semi-professional rugby for 25 years, Irish Catholic. Yeah. And he'll start a lot of his conversations. He's also a poet. And, uh, <laughs> and he'll say... You know, I just want you to know that by the end of our conversation, I don't want anything that is precious to you now to be less precious to you then. Mm -hmm. And I love that. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and one of the things that I said the other night was, you know, um, and I think this is a Holy Spirit thing, that the only time you'll find God in a box is because he wants to be where we are. Yeah. And I, I love, say that too. You look at the Old Testament that God loved yeah. us so much, He literally puts Himself in a box all the time, right? All the time because He loves us. Yep. So you know all this, all this divisiveness that mm -hmm. exists in Christendom, it doesn't originate in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, you know. And so one of my advantages, um, and and I understand this, is that I don't have to take it personally because of issues like job security or reputation or those kinds of things. Yep. Or, you know, trying to build a program or whatever, yep. whatever, you know, and so I have an advantage to that, 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 that folks, people don't understand that in institutional structural systems like religion, it's a hard road to be in charge of something that is inherently not living, mm -hmm. you know, and so, um, 
there is a whole bunch of tensions both within your own heart and trying to deal with the systemic potential for evil yeah um inside this conversation mm -hmm. so plus you've got all the same fears that every other human being does is like i gotta still pay my bills yeah. and, and my you know my mortgage payment yeah. and um and all of that comes into the conversation as well so defensiveness in terms of a conversation is heaped up by all this affective oh, stuff. For it's sure. rarely just stuff that oh we're intellectually disagreeing mm -hmm. that almost never happens when oh, no, we bring all of our experiences our baggage our, yeah. our perceptions everything yeah absolutely yeah i had a gal um i was getting on a flight uh from uh, Asheville, north carolina to, to atlanta which is only 23 minutes and um and I just had a nudge when I'm walking into the down the jetway that the, that woman who is four people ahead of me is going to be sitting next to me. And I was like, okay. So I pull out. I had one in my bag. I had one copy left of the shack. I usually carry one just to give to somebody. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had it out. And I stop her because I'm on the window. And, and I trip over her bag on my way into my seat, right? And just yeah. down. Book ends up right in her face. Oh, wow. Right? And I apologize. Sit down. Put the book in the back you know the pocket she sits down looks at me and she goes like you're not actually going to read that book are you mm. <laughs> i said well actually i've read it yeah have you she said yeah i read it about a year ago didn't like it mm -hmm. i said really what didn't you like about it and she was like off to the races so they got a funny mm. position to be in to go he has no idea who i am so I let's, know. Just, let's just play with this a little bit well, i know and 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 it wasn't to try to be mean or put her in position, but I'm like, I want I want to. It's the question. Like, I want to understand. Well, how many times is Jesus thinking like, you have no idea who I am, and you're asking me this question, but yeah. I care about you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm going to draw you out, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so she gets. I mean, she was riled up. Like this totally violates the principles of God. I didn't like the presentation of the Trinity. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And finally, when she took a breath, I said, so. Uh, what didn't you like about the Trinity? Mm. She's, she leans back. She goes like, uh, you know what? I don't remember, but I just didn't like it. And off she was to the races again. And But this time, and this is a common thing for people who have uh, religious indoctrinations of one sort or another, and we all do that, right? We're, we're all in boxes of one sort or another, mm -hmm. is that when, when you begin to not be sure of yourself, you begin to attack the character of the person rather than deal with the idea. That's one of the issues of civility, right? Yep. And, and, um, and people do that. They, they begin to make innuendos about their, the character of the person. And she starts doing that. So the next time she take a breath, I said, uh, do you know the author? Because she started sounding like she did, you know? Yeah. And she goes, no. And... You know those cartoon characters where you get that little light bulb that yep. sort of just pops up and flickers, yep. you know? I almost could see it. And she looks at me and she goes, you're not the author, are you? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. <laughs> she goes, no, you're not. I said, yeah, I am. She says, no, you're not. I had to show her my Delta Sky Miles card and two credit cards and my license. She's just more about it at the point. She's just hoping it's not. <laughs> she's just like, she can't. Yeah. You know, she, so at this point, she doesn't, I mean, what's she going to do, right? right. And she's, it's, so she leans back and she goes, oh, this is such a God thing. And I'm thinking like, what do you even mean by that? Yeah. <laughs> so at that point, I let her off the hook, you know, because it could get cruel at that point, you yeah. know? And I just said, look, forget about the book. You know, I, does, I'm not offended whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But tell me, I said, I'm really curious. How did you end up sitting next to me on a flight from Asheville, North Carolina, to Atlanta? Yeah. You know, what's your story? Yeah. And then she starts telling me about how she, had, a year before this, more than a year and a half before this, she had been on, her world was ruined. Mm -hmm. And she had been on a deep dive into, she had lost her family, she was an addict, she was homeless, all this. And some legalistic community of, brothers and sisters were out street preaching or something yeah. and she had an encounter with Jesus yeah. and Jesus saved her life mm. and that's the frame of reference yeah. that she had then was introduced to and it she was holding on to that with with every ounce of energy in white her. knuckling it yep 
because the alternative was what she had come from. Mm, yep. Yep. And and you know what? It doesn't. It doesn't. In that moment, it doesn't matter how wrong our thinking might be. You know, God's never waited for us to be perfect before He allows us to participate. Yeah. You know, so she grabs onto it, and I'm just like, I said, "Honey, you know, I've walked with Jesus a long time. You're on the greatest adventure a yeah. human being can experience, yeah. and I'm, and I frankly, I'm, I'm really impressed by your, your determination. Yeah. And uh, it'll, it'll hold you in good stead. But I said, you know, if, if, if God was sitting right here next to you." I think I know what he'd say to you. Yeah. She says, what? And I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, relax. Mm. And tears just start rolling down. You could just see this. Yeah. All this internal determination just like, and she takes a breath and she just starts to cry. So there, there's two things in that story that I, like, it's mulling in my head over and over and, and, and you're hitting them and <laughs> the questions that I want to ask anyway. So trying to figure out which one to go with first here. I'll go with the story thing first. And what I think, what I think I love about you, um, cause I mean, I, until this weekend, like, I, I mean, most of my interaction with you has been, you know, one book, Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, or people's opinions, right? Exactly. Love or hate. Yeah. And so be able to hear just, you know, like you're, you love stories. You love people's stories. You love yeah. like your normal entire weekend. is just about a story how God works in the midst of that story. But, one of the things that struck me as well, like, as a, as a back thing, so, never read the book, finally read the book, because I thought, okay, like, I, I need, like you said, a yeah. character, right? So I was like, I'll finally read it. Uh, and, and what I'm about to say, some people are, are going to want to, like, get angry for you. But, so when I read the book, like, the first time, because of course, through the lens I'm reading it, I'm thinking to myself, like, it, it really wasn't that bad. Like, it really, you know, like, theologically, I have people, yeah. but I also thought, it, it, for me at that time, it really wasn't that good. Yeah. You know, I'm like, there was nothing that, like, revolutionized, but there was nothing that was like, okay, there's something here that I'm just, like, ready to take you all back and stick you to a cross or whatever. Um, and, and and so it was a really interesting thing for me going, like, okay, it's a, it's a book, it's a story, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, oh, oh so that, that, would, going. that would be mine. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. I thought I maybe thought I didn't turn it out. Uh, now you got post-production work to do. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. No, we'll leave it in there. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. I have one of these mini pocketed things. Oh, shoot. Yeah, that's not good. Sideways. So, yeah, and I mean, for me, in that moment, like, what was, yeah, so the, I, I read it and thinking to myself, like, I can understand why some people, but where I was at was just like, okay, it's, it's a book, you know. <laughs> but in this weekend, something really struck me, and it's something else about understanding people's stories, right? Mm -hmm. When you were sharing, and again, this will be in the links, um, we'll be sharing as well, and you share the side of the story of, um, the, you know, that, um, the characters, Mackenzie and, and what's the daughter? Missy. Missy. That those represent, both represent you. Yeah. You know, the Mackenzie is your adult and Missy is your childhood, you know, and thinking about the fact that, you know, this is part of your story of what you went through, you know, in the church and, and the abuse and all of those things and having to re find your, 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 your childhood that had died, yeah. you know, and, and it's just like, I need to read that book again. Because what, what really struck me in that is, okay, there's critics to the book, but I think when you under like understand such a detail like that, yeah. that this this isn't like 
this isn't your manuscript of how every person should view God. Exactly. This is this is your story of how you had to wrestle through with all of this. I was just like just discussing things that had happened to you and how God is ministering to you in the midst of that. Yeah. But that was a huge thing, just listening to that going like, okay, if you want, somebody wants to criticize without even understanding the undertone. But not that you were like, you know, I'm going to explain to everybody, but it's because right. it speaks to different people different ways. And um, I think that that's a huge, huge thing. So even listening this person's story on the, the plane, using it as an opportunity to get underneath the surface, that it brings me to another, like, a bigger question, too, about when you talk about, these are my people, fundamentalists and things like that, or fundamental evangelical Christians, that there's the other side of the coin that just wants to, they want to burn it all down. Yeah. You know, I wrote this article, are we so ready to burn it all down? Because I'm just seeing all this, you know, like, it's the other side of the progressive that are with pitchforks ready to just, like, because of hurt, because there are other things that they want to just like dismantle or yeah, just burn it down. How how do you respond now to the others? Like, because you make that point, like you're ready to fight. So for that person who's watching, who loves your book, loves your stuff, that's in the more progressive side of things, how should we better respond now to the lady who, like you, you just said, she had an encounter with Jesus yeah. with a fundamentalist, legalistic yeah. church. Like you make that point. That God is working there. Absolutely. You know, and so there is no box that God is not in. Yeah. And 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 part of this is is that as you grow in appreciation for the goodness and the kindness and the beauty and the wonder of mm -hmm. God, as well as in God's fury against everything that is broken. Yep. And I believe that that wrath and fury is for us, not against us. Yeah. And I'm saying us as a human being. Yeah. Regardless of where we're coming from, our ethnicity, our background, our gender, or anything. And um, you begin to recognize in the other this incredible creation that is also your people. Mm -hmm. Right? So when she, when we got up after a 23-minute flight, she hugs me and she says, oh, I'll read the book. And I said, I don't care. Mm -hmm. And um, And then 20 minutes later in Atlanta on the train, I'd stop somewhere, but then I was trying to get to my gate. She walks on the train. Yeah. And she goes, Paul. Oh. Yeah. And it's like we've been the longest friends. Mm. But we have. We just didn't know it yeah. yet. And so part of the adventure is to live inside a world that's constantly dividing us mm -hmm. and refuse to be a participant in that division. And a, and a lot of us we want certainty, so we grab it from a position or an ideology or a theology or, or a flip philosophy. from one to the other. Yeah, yeah. And then as soon as we do, we exclude mm. those people, you know, and any of the language of those and us is divisive and doesn't originate. So let me ask you this question. That the us and them type of thing mm -hmm. is a, is a, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to push a little bit. On my progressive Great friends, because I, I have I have kind of, I'm a very different person than when I <laughs> than when I was up there railing against your book. Like I I've gone and yeah. and my big thing that I've noticed there's there's two things in, in that that are kind of my hobby horses, um, the idea of addicted to hope, it's right here on my arm, yeah. addicted to hope. That's something that is not talked about enough. And the other one is is dialogue. Yeah. Is it, I think if if we could figure out how to dialogue better, but one of the things that I've noticed too is that. The things that we champion sometimes don't realize we fall into those traps. And so pushing a little bit, because I know that, again, you, you, a lot of progressives would probably be like, this is a man, you know what I mean? To look at the side, too, of like, they want to champion the us against them, and they're pointing out into the other side how they're doing that wrong, but sometimes they don't realize that they're also doing it as if, well. If progression means that I learn to love better, yeah. then prove it. Mm. Right? Even to the ones that you adamantly are, you know. If if you have moved into a place of greater freedom than than you were in, mm -hmm. that freedom is designed to free you to mm -hmm. love better, right? And and not to exclude. Mm -hmm. So if if your freedom now makes you an asshole, you know, so, <laughs> so then then you better check to yeah. see what exactly you were freed from, yeah. you know. So. Here's, here's the adventure that we're invited into. Let's stop this nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know? Let's begin to see the high value of creation the way God does. And, and here's where our theology does matter. 
a lot of us inherited a theology where God had a very low view of humanity. Mm -hmm. and, and we were taught that. So we came into this whole conversation shame-based, mm -hmm. with a very low view of humanity, including ourselves. Mm -hmm. Jesus then becomes sort of an afterthought to the powerful person of Adam who basically ruined the entire universe. And, uh, but think about it. This is God who forever joins himself to our humanity. Yeah. You think that's a low view of humanity? No. You think a God who then submits to us, submits to the cross, our torture device? Yeah. <laughs> that's a low view of humanity? The fact that evil exists is because God submits to yeah. our ability to do damage. Mm. You know? and, and if we don't begin to understand that we were a very good creation prior to any of the brokenness, we will function from shame. Yeah. We will have a low view of our humanity, trying to cover it up, and then we're back to performing. What, and I love how you make you make the distinction between shame and guilt. Huge distinction. Right? It's and I think for some people when they want to throw away shame, they want to throw throw away the guilt as well. Yeah. That we no, are guilt's this, legit. Yeah, we're guilty. When we hurt someone, when we violate, when we betray, we're guilty. Mm -hmm. And um, and and we experience the sorrow of that, a righteous regret, mm -hmm. and that actually leads to wholeness. Yeah. Shame, guilt, I've done something wrong. Shame, I am something yeah. wrong. And that has no place within mm -hmm. reality. That is a part of the darkness that we brought to the table. Yep. There is no shame in the relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, um, and no shame in, in who we are as human beings. Mm -hmm. We were a very good creation and are a very good creation mm -hmm. and our new creation in Christ. All those things are statements out of the Scriptures. Mm -hmm. and, and yet... We have a low view of humanity. I'm wondering, we have a low view of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So thinking about even with dialogue, going going back to that, sometimes in my mind, what I think is always interesting is like I, I've tried, especially online. It's a little easier for me because I have some time to kind of like get, I'm getting worked up, so I'm yeah. just going to walk away. Exactly. I'm not. I don't have to be. But one of the things I always find funny is like I I try and champ is like you know my objective here isn't to you know try to make a point at this point. I could, but I just noticed that we, my hobby horse is dialogue, so I try to ask a lot of questions, but I, so people even get skeptical of that. They're like, sure. well, I want to hear what your position is. And it's like trying to flip it and go, but I, I haven't understand what you're actually trying to say. Yeah. And so have you ever found, like, because even with the story of, like, you have this, this person who's Adam, who has a position who is adamantly against what you wrote, yeah. and by the, <laughs> by the end of the flight, yeah. It is it's you've made it's, you've flipped right because you've engaged that person as a human being. As a human being, but have you ever have you run into people as well that they like you're trying to ask those questions that automatically there are some there are some conversations where where no conversation or dialogue is allowed, mm -hmm. and that's okay. You know they're coming to vent or they're coming to mm -hmm. to state their position or whatever, and you know and if you're if you're not at risk, and you can feel it inside when things are coming up and tightening up and stuff like that, and you know trigger points. Yep. And um, and yet, as you learn to live inside that tension, and you learn to love the other who is in front of you, you get a nudge about how to respond, whether mm -hmm. it's to go in for the hug that just like mm -hmm. that, you know, or or like our kids do, you know. Had to touch noses. Yeah, you know, it's hard hard to keep that uh, you know distance when you diffuse touch noses. Yeah. diffuse that yeah. just the whole. So thing. so what's the you know what's the touching noses at this point mm. in, in regard to this person? What you know how how can I look for where the Holy Spirit is active because the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all flesh. Mm -hmm. So I know that the Holy Spirit's been poured out. It's Acts chapter 2. Yeah. It wasn't like some. You know, it was all. So, okay, so the Holy Spirit's active here. Help me, Holy Spirit, see where you're active. And let me see if I can fan that flame. And a lot of times, you've got to get out of the out of the head. You know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's where story comes in. Like, so tell, tell me about your family. Yeah. You know? Well, and it, it's interesting, too, because so often... People like eat, you know, on either side of the coin, wherever, wherever you're, wherever you are on the spectrum, or, or it doesn't matter, because you said, we, you know, we have this this inherent need to, for certainty or to be right, yeah. and even when we're 
come full big out of that and want others to see that perspective, to see that freedom, even if you're coming from a healthy perspective, the tendency is we want to see change in that person's life, but what we revert to is making a point. Yeah. And I, I don't remember who was the first one that said it. There's a bunch of people that said it, but it's like, are you simply trying to make a point? Are you wanting to be right, or are you looking for change? See, a lot of us want to play the Holy Spirit and not trust the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, exactly. Yep, and that's that's why we're dangerous. <laughs> you know, I have. You're been, here. You should be here. So how I'm going to push you into that? Thing. I know. I can I can heal you, yeah. and I can fix you. Yeah. How ridiculous is that? I mean, yeah. we haven't even been able to fix or heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, so in in so many of these situations, I, I want to learn to trust the Holy Spirit, and and. Part of it is, the things that matter to me are largely in place. Not that I don't have some tensions, but my I know who I am. I know my identity. Mm -hmm. Identity, worth, value, mm -hmm. significance. When I found out that I am significant, ontologically, that is, that I am significant by just being, yeah. that was a huge shift for me, because my significance had always come from doing. Yeah. You know, from being smart, you know, or doing smart, you know, which is... Being right, doing right yeah. in, in the argument. And to find out that, you know, I'm significant, therefore I can do anything. I can clean toilets. I can, mm -hmm. you know, serve. I can change diapers. I can take out garbage. In. You know, I, I, can, I can do anything because it has no impact on my significance. But if I don't know that, then I'm at war in every, mm. in every conversation, right? So all of these things, identity, worth, value, significance, security, meaning, purpose, destiny, community, love, all of those things, if they're at risk in a conversation, we bring all that to the table. Fight or flight. Fight or flight. And uh, some of us, you know, um, uh, we, we learn to hide knives inside words, mm. and it's no longer about that person, it's about defending the things that we feel bad about yeah. ourselves. Yeah. So, let's flip. Let's flip the script. Yeah. Spent a lot of time about the empathy, the learning, the questioning, um, but there is the other side of disagreement. Right. Oh, yeah. And so let, let's go, let's go right to the other end. When in your mind, you like, maybe, maybe in your mind there isn't. <laughs> it's your platform. We can answer this question whenever you want. <laughs> when do you see the perspective where it needs to say, like, you know, I, I need to stand. Boundaries, for, right? Well, boundaries for yourself, but also even just like. This is wrong. This is wrong. I, I, I need to make a statement to say, I I cannot let you just walk away. See, and there's, and there's no formula to this. Oh, no, yeah. Uh, yeah, understanding that, yes. that there are times where Jesus says, you guys, and it's and it's a warning of love. It is an invitation, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, woe to you, which is like stop. Yeah. In, in Hebrew, woe means like we mean with a horse. You know, it mm -hmm. doesn't mean like I'm going to pound you. No, you're about it to, means yeah. stop. Yeah. Stop. Don't you guys Lord understand? Reigns. Yeah. And you're pulling down a whole bunch of people with you. Mm -hmm. Stop. And there's the time that he cleans out the tent twice, you know. And then there is the times where he's absolutely silent. And everything around him is wrong. Mm -hmm. Right? So, again, this happens inside an expression of love. His, his antagonism against the Pharisees were because of the depth of his love and the darkness that surrounded them. Mm -hmm. Right? And so there is a time to say, no, no, this is wrong. And, and we don't know how to do that well. We don't know how to love meant well, we don't know how to grieve well, and we don't know how to say, this is wrong. Fury is the right response to things that are wrong. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, it is never expressed apart from other-centered, self-giving love. So I'm in a conversation with uh, a young man who hurt someone who is incredibly dear to me. Mm -hmm. Just violent precious one, you know, mm -hmm. and I know, I know that he's precious too. I know that emotionally I am so furious. And so we sit down and we're talking and, and he spins the story like he wants to spin the story, mm -hmm. like we have a tendency to do. And I'm just old enough and have gone, gone through this in my own life enough. So yeah. I, I know the banter. Mm -hmm. And... Finally, I stop him and say, you know what, I'm so not impressed by how you're spinning this. And he recognizes that I don't buy it. 
and um, and he starts to then go to another place of self-protection, which happens to be um, all I am is a piece of fruit. It's not the word he used, not the word I then used either. But but he's and, and I said to him, you know what? If there's anybody on this planet who knows you're not just a piece of shit, it's me. Mm-hmm. But you are full of it. You're not. You're, that's not your identity. Mm-hmm. But you're full of it. And so let's let's talk clearly here. Mm-hmm. And and that was not that long ago, but it was a piece of the catalyst that helped him face the darkness that was in his own heart that that moved him to violate precious human beings. Mm-hmm. the way that he did. And uh, amongst another, a whole lot of other people and relationships that, and and he has responded to it. Right? And there is a process of reconciliation going on. But yeah, and you know, I'm in situations all the time where people are saying things that I absolutely flat out disagree. I was in a, a, a men's thing, and I have a friend, Scott, my best friend, and Scott is standing next to me. He knows that what's being said is just lighting a fire under Right? And he's kind of watching me to see what I'm going to do. And I'm upset. And I'm trying to figure out whether to say anything or not. You know, and I'm in that moment and I'm about to. And Scott leans over and says to me, So do you think they've got everything they have? Hmm. And it changed it in an instant. He pushed me back into the river of kindness and goodness and grace. Not that I wasn't angry with what they were saying, but it was like, moment they're bringing everything they've got this is what they have mm-hmm. and if I'm not at risk in the conversation if I don't want to be God's messenger of truthfulness and rightfulness and you know all this other stuff then I can appreciate that this is what they've brought to the table now how do I respond to mm-hmm. you know and it, it was a huge help for me in that moment and I think a lot of times yeah and a lot of times we have to jump in and say no Mackenzie in, in, the, in the scene in the cave I'm not going to make this judgment this is, you know, what you're asking me is wrong so I'll go, you know mm-hmm. if, if this is what the if this is what you're like, take it out on me mm-hmm. you know, so yeah uh, it's a crazy thing to be inside of I don't have to defend myself and I don't have to defend God mm-hmm. you know so what is helpful here, what's loving here even if it's fury. Yeah. And this goes back to who do we think God is? Somebody who uses punishment to try to write some scales of justice or someone who really is after the restoration of the heart and the person because it's the person they love and furious at everything that keeps them from being free. Well, I get to participate in that. Mm-hmm. That fury doesn't originate in me, but I can sure darken it with all my crap. So it's like, all right, so let's learn how to do this. And, uh, and the more these, these conversations and your commitment to dialogue is, I think, essential in this, learning how. How do we have this conversation without it all just going to our heads? And now my head is against your head. Mm. And that's a lot of times what it ends up being. Intellectual, who can out-rationalize the other person? And it never changes anybody. No. You know? And uh, so we've got to build from relationship rather than from rationality or from argumentation. Mm-hmm. Now, argumentation begins with division anyway. And uh, if you know that I love you and, and I know that you love me, our conversation is going to be vastly different than if that's not even been established mm-hmm. yet. You have to earn my approval or affection you know, yeah. by, by being smart or something yeah. you know, or by agreeing with me. Yeah. You know. I think it is a wonderful place to stop. Uh, I think that I don't think I don't think I want to go any further. Like, just I think that's a, yeah, the, the land for people just you know right there. Have you read Andrew Marin's book on civility and discourse? Andrew Marin, M A R I N. He wrote "Love Is an Orientation," mm-hmm. best book on spirituality in the on the LGBTQ community, mm-hmm. and "Us Versus Us," which is a research project. But then he's got a book, and I can't think of the name. Yeah, 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 for sure. Andrew Marin, and and uh, 
he's just finished his PhD at Aberdeen, and uh, but he's brilliant, and he's involved with this dialogue. He yeah. he would have rabid um, gay activists spend a weekend in Chicago with extreme right wing mm. fundamentalist Christians called uh, in the tension gatherings, nice. and then teach them you know, over the course of a week how to begin to have a discourse that actually was face-to-face. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, it's good to know, too, because our team is in the middle of seven authors writing mm-hmm. on healthy and helpful dialogue from yeah. all different, and different backgrounds. Just phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, for sure. Uh.